Good morning and welcome to Crossroads with George Cavour. God is good and his mercies endure forever. Praise the Lord. So good to welcome you this morning to Crossroads. Winter has is steadily and slowly and surely creeping in. Praise the Lord. I hope you're all well and God is renewing, restoring and encouraging you. Praise the Lord. How deep the Father's love is. Praise God. Morning Jessica. Hi Asha. Nice to see you today. Praise God. We have a wonderful Savior and His name is Jesus. Hallelujah. So good to see each and every one of you here this morning. And I pray that the Lord will encourage each and every one of us. Alex, Asha, Jema Siki, God bless you guys. In the meanwhile, as we come into his presence this morning, we praise the Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you, O Lord, that you love us and you care for us. I pray, Lord, that you would be very present with us today. Forgive us our shortcomings and our failures. We want to thank you for the gift of life, for rescuing us and giving us your salvation. Thank you for protecting, preserving, and providing for all our needs. Thank you for yet another day. Guide and lead us every step of the way, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Morning, Victor. Good to see you this morning. And my prayer is that even as we listen to God's word, God will speak to us. So, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, reading from verse 12 to 20. Open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1 to 20. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1 to 20. So, my brothers and sisters, here is Paul writing to one of the early churches in the body of Christ. He's writing to the Christians who live in that interesting place called Corinth. Highly cosmopolitan, very, very progressive as a society. And there are many things that we can see in Corinth that we would call immorality. And the things that were happening in Corinth are happening even today. But the difference is this, that yesterday's old immorality is today's morality. Hi, Nick. So 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12 to 20. Everything is lawful for me, but not everything is beneficial or helpful. Everything is lawful for me, but I will not let myself be dominated by anything. Food for the stomach and the stomach for food. But God will do away with both the one and the other. 
The body, however, is not for immorality, but the Lord and the Lord is for the body. God raised the Lord and also raised us by His power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take Christ's members and make them the member of a prostitute? Of course not. Or do you not know that anyone who joins himself to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For the two, it says, will become one flesh. But whoever is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Avoid immorality. One spirit with him means avoid immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the immoral person sins against his own body. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? Do you have... For you have been purchased at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. Amen. In this section, Paul is dealing with Christian freedom and liberty. And he is explaining some of the consequences of abusing our freedom. I love this phrase in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 12, everything is lawful for me, but not everything is beneficial. Everything is lawful for me, but I will not let myself be dominated by anything. What is Paul saying here? What he is saying? is that in Christ we have been set free from our past and in Christ we have a new freedom, a new liberty. Hi John. And so this morning I want you to take stock of your lives and ask yourself the question, in what way am I set free? In what ways has Christ rescued me? How has the death of Jesus on the cross impacted my life? Remember in Luke's Gospel chapter 4, Jesus reiterates that Isaiah prophecy and he says, it has been fulfilled in me. For he says, for the Spirit of the Lord is upon me to proclaim good news to the poor, liberty to the captives, sight to the blind. My brothers and sisters, in Christ we have been set free. God has rescued us from the consequences of our sin. So he's explaining to us that when we have been rescued, when we have been set free from the bondages of Satan and the addictions of the flesh and the allurements of the world, God wants us to live in this newfound freedom. But he's trying to help us understand a very important principle. Just because you are free, your actions and your deeds have consequences. So not everything that you do is actually helpful, nor is it beneficial. So yes, you have freedom. But the choices you make can lead to negative consequences, harmful consequences. So remember you have been rescued by Jesus, set free from the clutches of the enemy, 
free from the consequences of sin, which is death, we have a faith to live by and a hope that sustains us. And yet, be watchful, be careful, because the actions you choose can have very hazardous consequences. You with me? Because not all the choices that you and I make can be helpful. Hi Rani and hi Abner. We are looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 6. I'm reiterating the first verse. Paul writes to the church at Corinth, which is a very progressive church, a church where they think they are fashionable, they are contemporary, they are sophisticated. And what is Paul saying to them? Yes, Jesus has freed you and set you free. But remember this, freedom comes with responsibilities. Because your freedom can have some very negative consequences. And you'll have to live with that for the rest of your life. Yes, God will forgive you, but the damage it does, the consequences that it has, not only on you, but on others, will be something that you will regret. So remember this, everything is lawful in Christ, but not everything is helpful or beneficial. Think about that. Yes, in Christ, you have freedom. There are lots of things that you are allowed to do. But be careful, because your choices that you make, the actions that you engage in, have profound significance. Some of it can be very positive, but equally some of it can be very negative. And harmful, not beneficial. So he says, if everything is lawful for me, I will not let myself be dominated by anything. What controls you? What is the thing that has power over you? Paul says, I will not be dominated by people, the world, my flesh, or the devil. I am surrendered to Christ, and I want to live for the glory of Christ. So, look at verse 13. Food for the stomach, and the stomach for food. But God will do away with both the one and the other. Yes, as long as we are living in this world, we need to feed ourselves. And people like me who love my food have to always remember we eat to live, not li live to eat. We eat to live, but not live to eat. Food must not dominate us. No wonder the Bible designates gluttony as a sin, excessive eating. And I have to be very careful because I can so easily fall into gluttony. I enjoy food and I enjoy cooking food. But of late, I would say, my appetite has so diminished that I hardly eat any food. Maybe the Lord is helping me, but this is something that I have noticed in my own life. We are called to eat food but we are not called to live for food. There's a very massive difference in those two statements. 
And furthermore, Paul says, there will come a time when we are in the presence of God when we will not need any of these earthly food. Our heavenly food will always satisfy us and give us huge amounts of contentment. Praise the Lord. Then he is going on to build his argument. He says, look, the body is important. Never underestimate it. Do not abuse it. The body is important because Christ rose from the dead with his body. Remember, he showed Thomas the physical wounds of the nail, the imprints of the nail, and that of the spear. God raised the Lord with the body. And so we too will be raised by his body. Irony. Do you not know that your bodies are also members of Christ? Shall I then take away Christ's members and make them members of a prostitute? He's now graphically trying to help us understand that when we have been rescued by the Lord Jesus, we belong to Jesus and we are incorporated into the body of Christ. So when we make bad choices and we indulge in sexual immorality and go to prostitutes, then of course, how can you imagine being a member of Christ's body and equally going into prostitutes? Shall I then take Christ's members and make them the members of a prostitute? The indignation and the horror that Paul evokes with this statement. Of course not, is the rhetorical retort. Do you not know that anyone who joins himself to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For the two, it says, will become one flesh. When we get married, and we enjoy having sex with our wife or husband, we are engaging in something sacred. Sexual union between a married couple is something to be enjoyed, something to be experienced, and something to be honored. And yet, having sex outside of marriage is a betrayal of trust. How can you say you are one flesh when you betray someone's trust? Whoever is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with Him. When we are baptized in Christ, we die unto self and we are incorporated into the body of Christ. And when the Holy Spirit indwells within us, we become one spirit with God. Avoid immorality. Every other sin, when we do it, is something we do outside the body. But sexual sins, are against one's own body. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? Now here is the crux of the matter. Paul is saying, can you conceptualize your body as the temple of the Holy Spirit, the dwelling place of the Spirit of God? If you are the temple of the living God, then make sure that you look after the temple. Make sure that it's clean. Make sure that it's pure and undefiled. We are not our own because Christ died for us. He purchased us and he sets us free. Yes, God wants us to live 
a holy and blameless life. Preserve and protect us and keep us close to you, Lord Jesus. Remember verse 20, for you have been purchased at a price. What is the price? The death of Jesus on the cross of Calvary. We have been purchased by his blood. Therefore, live a holy and undefiled life. Glorify God in and through your body. You know, my brothers and sisters, this morning, I think this message is very pertinent. Live a clean life. Live a healthy life. He live a life of responsibility. Despite the fact that we know we have full freedom in Christ. Isn't that wonderful? We have full freedom in Christ because we've been purchased at a price. And therefore we are called to be holy. We have a responsibility of living a distinctive lifestyle, a life that is pleasing God. So this morning, I want you to dwell and to think about the depth of God's love, the depth of God's care, how deep the Father's love is. Yes, Lord, help me. How deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that he should give his only son to make a wretch his treasure. How great the pain of searing loss, the Father turns his face away as wounds which mar the chosen one bring many sons to glory. Hi, Erica. Behold the man upon a cross, my sin upon his shoulders. Ashamed, I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. His dying breath has brought me life. I know that it is finished. Praise you, Jesus. I give you the glory and the honor. We thank you, Lord. We praise you, Lord. I will not boast in anything, no gifts, no power, no wisdom, but I will boast in Jesus Christ, His death and resurrection. Why should I gain from His reward? I cannot give an answer, but this I know with all my heart. His wounds have paid my ransom. Why should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer. But this I know with all my heart, His wounds have paid my ransom. Yes, Lord, I want to praise you. I want to give you the glory because you have died on the cross and set me free. 
Lord, I thank you for the freedom I have in Christ Jesus. I thank you that you love me and you care for me. I thank you that you love the world and each and every aspect of your creation. Forgive us, O oh Lord, for sinning and falling and failing you every day of our lives in so many ways. Master, rescue us and help us to recognize that with true freedom comes great responsibilities. Help us to learn to live a life that is pleasing in your sight. Now, Lord, I pray for everyone as they struggle with their flesh, as they struggle with the values of the world, as they struggle against our adversary, the devil, that you will give them the power to overcome. We've been called to be overcomers. So thank you, Lord, and keep us in the center of your will. Guide and lead us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and abide with each one of us now and forevermore. Amen. I pray that you would keep us in the center of your will. Guide and direct us, Lord Jesus. Help us to live in your true freedom. My brothers and sisters, God richly bless you and keep you. Be blessed. Stay blessed. But remember, each one of us is called to become a blessing to someone today. Bye-bye. I'll see you tomorrow morning. Till then, keep smiling. Bye-bye.